All right. Hi there. Thanks for tuning in. This is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com, BlogTalkRadio.com forward slash election channel. And today we're interviewing Matt Funicello, Green Party candidate for the U.S. House District 21, New York 2016 for the U.S. House. So we are interviewing people who are just uh, the only third option on the ballot. And you can see all the interviews that we've done at LibertarianProgressive.com. And uh, we have a wide range there, Libertarians, Independents, Green Party, um, and some other third parties you might not have heard of. Uh, we find that um, not really even paying attention to the presidential election so much as the congressional races. They're a lot less divisive to talk about. There's been many polls where people said that they, uh, you know, would throw them all out. And... Um, all right, so here's Matt calling in now. Let's bring him in. All right, so Matt, good to talk to you today. I was just, uh, you know, giving you a little bit of an introduction there. And um, Well, I appreciate right. that immensely, Thomas. Thank you very much for the introduction. Absolutely. And let's go read off your website here. Matt uh, Funicello at uh, forcongress.org. That's M-A-T-T-F-U-N-I-C-I-E-L-L-O-F-O-R congress.org. And, um, and yeah, we don't want to first... screw that up because any hedge fund managers who may be listening who want to call in, we want to make sure they uh, they send the money to the right address. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, and looking at it's a very nice website, and uh, you know you have home contribute about news issues, get involved, video events, and contact. And so out of all of those, I want to get to the issues first. That's what I always click on first. And um, and you have issues, Medicare for all, $15 minimum wage, real farm policy, corporate welfare, energy and climate, Green New Deal, military industry. So, you know, this is a program um, we hope to be about substance and, uh, you know, informing the public of their options. So if, if you don't mind going over those issues, Matt, and then we can use have some follow-up questions afterwards. We'd love to hear your not, issues. Not at all. Not at all. Um, I'll start with Medicare for All, which is uh, an employer in upstate New York. I have uh, run a bread bakery for, oh boy, it's probably been almost 30 years now. As I started it when uh, I was 20 with my brother, and we've always had employees, but 35 is about the constant number. Uh, health insurance for all Americans who work for a living has become a, a real struggle. Uh, the average amount spent on health care in this country, private and public put together per person, I believe, is just over $9,000 at the moment. And what a lot of Americans don't realize um, is something that is, as a person who is educated in Canada, I spent 12 years of my life with my mother in Ottawa, Ontario. So those were my growing years, and I spent my summers on my father's farm here in the district in upstate New York and then moved back when I was 20. Uh, during that period when I was in Canada, I had Canadian health care. I have relatives and uh, many, many friends who live there uh, and have the Canadian Medicare for All system. Uh, which is run by each province individually. That system, it's estimated, costs roughly $4,200 per Canadian per year. Um, here in the United States, the expenditure by the, the government itself, the federal government is actually pulling more than $6,000 per citizen out of the Federal Reserve and using it to bolster up the healthcare industry. So it's not using that $6,000 to give any of us insurance or care. Um, it is using it to pay for profits for CEOs of Big Pharma, uh, to help build hospitals that may or may not be necessary, but that are mostly set up as for-profit mechanisms. Uh, and as I like to joke, you know, for the machine that goes bing, as according to the Monty Python uh, experience and meaning of life, uh, we subsidize everything that goes on. We already have socialized medicine, but the difference between us and the other 37 nations that are ranked higher than we are by the World Health Organization in terms of result uh, we have uh, the hugest number of uninsured or uncovered because ours is still a for-profit private system. Single payer for all at the congressional level is called H.R. 676, and it literally would give uh, an improved Medicare program 
to every single citizen in the country. And obviously, if we equated it with the Canadian system, we'd be saving somewhere between $1,500 and $2,000 per person the day we started that program uh, simply by removing profit. Um, from the equation uh, and the graft and corruption and the subsidy of the pharmaceutical companies who are already uber profitable. But I, I don't want to speak about all of the other issues in that degree um, right. of intensity. Right. No, you we will end that up one. with no radio uh, show. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. No, no, I'm sold. Uh, I guess, who do I vote for to get that to happen? Um, so, uh all right. So well, and, that's, and that's we the crux, a... of course, is that if we vote Democrat or Republican, there are almost no Democrats or Republicans who support it because of the amount of big pharma money they are taking uh, in campaign donations. So they all talk about a public option when they put an ACA through, uh, but they're not going to do it. John Conyers and Nancy Pelosi will be standing right there to sweep it off the table and under the carpet on day one, just like they did. And we end up with a horrible anti-worker bill like the ACA, which basically is a health insurance company bailout. You know, it's forcing right. people to buy a really terrible private uh, insurance product. Um, but the other, the other issues, very quickly, just to get them out of the way so we sure. can actually speak like human beings do, uh, would be a $15 minimum wage. As a businessman, I'm often asked on the campaign trail uh, why I would support such a thing. And it's because I do everything in my power already to pay that. Um, we are only about 40 cents shy of that um, at my place of business, and we're in the food service in upstate New York. So, you know, very low bargain basement wages are the norm up here. The minimum wage is $9 in New York State for this work, um, and about 10 or $11 is what is paid in the market regularly for people who are going to stay. And these are, these are slave wages. They really are, and there's no point in calling them anything different. We need to honor the reasons why a minimum wage was first developed and you know roosevelt did not say because we want to employ kids at an amusement park at less than it's worth for an adult to work uh he said that you know the minimum wage should always reflect what it would take for somebody working a full-time job to make a decent living and although i don't think 15 is the number 1650 is actually what cost of living would have us at if we just went by worker productivity it would be 23 dollars and 90 cents an hour based on corporate profit. So, you know, to me, it's just a matter of, of social injustice. It's also a way to get rid of welfare. You know, whether you're conservative or liberal, if you really look at that issue, a national salary or raising a minimum wage to a living wage, either way, all of a sudden, there are a lot of people who work for a living who are no longer the working poor. You know, they now don't need SNAP or subsidized housing or Medicaid. Um, they're going to be able to afford to pay for these things on their own a little more easily. Uh, yeah, it's great to hear. One. I'm sorry, I was just oh. going to say it's great to hear a small business owner making, um, you know, these arguments. Uh, I think it has a little more clout than some someone who's been a career politician or, or something like. So that's very interesting. Yes, and you're going to go into farm policy. Go ahead. Well, the flip the flip side too with the minimum wage is that you know the Democrats for a long time have been saying that they are they're going to push for ten ten an hour or eleven dollars an hour. The the irony is any time I've gone to my state legislature to lobby as an active citizen, I'm the only business person there, <laughs> and I always go there and I say you know you guys need to look up in your economics textbooks wage led growth. Henry Ford way back in the day paid his assembly line workers about twice what the prevailing wage was. And he was asked about that by journalists, and he always would say, because I'm an intelligent human being, I would like my workers to be able to afford the products they're making. That's how you develop a market. And we've forgotten that in the United States. We think it's okay to become a third world country and keep passing all of these fake free trade deals, which are really you know, rigged trade deals. Uh, and the Democrats are, in my district anyway, running, saying they're against them. Well, in truth, their, their party, their president, and their current presidential candidate um, are very much free traders, and certainly uh, Hillary and her husband Bill were responsible for pushing through NAFTA and GATT when Reagan and Bush couldn't do it for 12 years prior. You know, I mean, the death of the manufacturing class is also the death of the middle class and of our unions, and if we don't have a standard set that is higher than other countries, then we're going to become a third world country. Uh, not okay with me as a business owner or as a worker. No, uh, that's um, very well said. And I'm interested in this farm policy. I do think there should be a lot more um, homesteading, a lot more, you know, organic farming. And, and that's, that's a, I, I'm very interested in it. What, what is your policies on that? 
Well, I'm I'm a little bit more libertarian in my views than the average green when it comes to farm policy. I'm beginning to believe that really the best answer is to keep the federal government out of it. I mean, our food supply is toxic, and it's been made toxic by corporate engineering of our food. And I don't just mean GMOs, of course. I mean pesticides and chemicals that are being employed. But it also is efficiencies of production. Um, when you have a dairy farm in upstate New York, and we've centralized our agriculture so every area has a certain specialty now, upstate New York is dairy farming, orchards, and vineyards primarily, <laughs> um, for whatever reason. Uh, but essentially what happens then is you lose um, your more natural uh, agricultural setup. It's already unnatural to have agriculture. You know, we're, we're, if we go back to what worked on the planet for millions of years, it was certainly hunter-gatherers who did the least damage, I think most anthropologists would agree. So why in our farm policy are we supporting, you know, the 10,000 head um, beef farm operation in CAFO rather than my father raising 25 dextra beef cattle at a time that are grass-fed? And the answer is efficiency. You know, the cost of the meat that he's raising on his farm is far greater. Would it be far greater if my father got the same kinds of subsidies that the beef industry does or that if he was allowed to be a welfare rancher and, and you know, have his beef graze on uh, cattle lands that were owned by the public? Of course not. So a lot of my libertarian friends who are in farming in upstate New York say the answer is not to retool the farm bill which every year gets passed, and it's a nightmare for any small farmer. It's all designed and written by corporate agriculture. It's um, just making sure that the regulatory agencies will come after the small growers and producers. It's never aiming itself at altering what's wrong with the massive production of food and distribution over thousands of miles. Um, so what I, what I have learned that most of the small farmers want is no subsidy whatsoever, but they want to have to stop competing with these massive corporations who are also subsidized. They're saying end all of the subsidies. Uh, my farm policy would be a little a little softer than that in that I kind of have a vision of that young uh, husband and wife who have just you know gotten out of Cornell, Cornell Agricultural College and want to set up a farm, and they lack the capital to do it on even a mid-sized level. You know, so let's buy them their tractor. You know? <laughs> I don't think it has to be overly complicated. Um, but essentially, well, um, farm, we all eat food, so we should care a lot more about uh, what the federal government is doing about farm policy. Uh, right now, it's not helping us to have healthier food. Well, I think that there's a growing consensus about food. I mean, if you look at all the polls, in fact, I mean, if you look at polls and uh, and what people want, I mean, and if you go down your issues list, um, you know, people have a choice and uh, they can take responsibility and, and research the candidates and see, you know, what issues are matching with what things that they want to accomplish. And so let me ask you this. Um, how come you're running as a Green Party candidate and, and not in the two-party system of a Republican or Democrats? Well, that answer is a pretty simple one, and it really does just boil down to corporate money. Um, I was inspired by Ralph Nader when he ran in uh, 2000, and I was really proud that there was a political party that would be forward-thinking enough that they would realize that that's, that's the revolution, to have Atticus Finch run for president. <laughs> And uh, I love Ralph. I just think he's he's a national treasure. He's brilliant. He spent many, many, many decades, five of them now, really, uh, working for the working class of the United States and working t for the environment um, and working for the cause of peace. And, you know, he is he's only been given grief for for doing it. And that's a terrible travesty. But when he ran in 2000, he he laid waste to. Uh, a lot of the Democrats' claims, because we've watched now for 16 years as they basically, instead of opening up our democracy and giving us a disbanding of the Electoral College or electoral reform or campaign finance reform or ballot access reform or publicly funded elections, the Democrats have done none of that and are working with the, Demo uh, pardon me, with the Republican Party um, to ensure that, that smaller third parties and alternative parties can't play in the game at all. So, yeah, so what kind I of election really... reform do you think um, would 
would be useful. Um, do you have any ideas for election reform or ideas that you would support in regarding that? Well, I've I've always been in favor of either a ranked voting system or instant runoff voting, which um, is used in in many other countries. And ironically enough, it's used in a lot of state legislatures by Republicans. <laughs> Uh, but it is yeah. it is not a household word in the United States, IRV, um, and it should be. And whether we use that system or another like it, I really value proportional uh, representation over and above the winner-take-all system we have now. Um, the winner-take-all system allows us to have two absolutely horrific candidates in almost every race in the country that is federal, uh, if not on right down to the state level, too. Uh, you might have some municipal or county politics going on where real human beings who are um, not completely stained by the, the corporate sponsorship of their particular branch of the party <laughs> may be running for office. But in general, by the time they get to the state ledge or they're running for federal office, they are completely tainted. And I don't trust any of them. So, you know, since that 2000 election, I'm I'm not ever voting anything but green, maybe libertarian, occasionally for an independent candidate I trust or no. Um, but I, I really don't understand why any voter... Uh, is ever voting for the Democrat or Republican Party. It really does seem to me to be against our interests equally in almost every single election cycle, in almost every geography. Uh, but I can it's at a least... slow, hard slog to convince people of that. Well, I can at least understand some people thinking as far as the presidential races go. And, and our organization doesn't even get into the presidential races. We find congressional Races can be a lot less divisive, um, less, quote unquote, risky and, and controversial. So, I mean, you, you know, our, I can envision uh, an independent or third party candidate uh, coming from each state, uh, possibly. Um, and, and just introducing a little just a little bit of competition, um, you know, which supposedly we're always sold on how good competition is. How about some competition <laughs> in our Congress? And, uh, or, or how so about having competition by allowing third-party candidates to debate? Um, you know, and that's yeah. something in my race that they were good about. I ran in 2014, and I'm of course running again this year in District 21 uh, in upstate New York, and did did historically well. I'm not patting myself on the back, but uh, we we did a great job. Our campaign and our volunteers were amazing, uh, and we got 11% of the vote. And 11% when you raise $38,000 from inside the district and you're running against a, a multimillionaire from Brooklyn far outside your district and another uh, a millionaire who's worked in the Bush White House and is a Washington insider, <laughs> uh, it's not really a fair race money-wise. Um, but I was endorsed by three out of four papers in our district and, um, you know, by all accounts, won our debates, too. But the, the voters came along ten times more than they normally do uh, in a race like this. And I think this time around we're going to – I think we'll at least double that result. I think we're having a much bigger impact this time around, even though it's a general election cycle. But my point – was, Tom, that I think in the end, we all have to point the finger back at ourselves. There are plenty of things wrong with the way Democrats and Republicans run things, and they are the only ones you can point the finger to if you want to blame the system. But I'm saying let's create some alternatives to work within that system to make change. Um, and if you're going to do that, those, the, the most important ingredient is do not take corporate money. And Greens do that as a policy. Our party doesn't take it. Our candidates don't take it. So, you know, no PAC money either. So you're not buying a human being who is already under the control of a corporation that wants to push through legislation uh, or who wants to sell something to the government. You, you, at the very least, are getting a flawed human being who is imperfect and who admits that they are <laughs> uh, and is just doing what they can uh, out of sincere intent. And I think most frequently that makes us the best candidates in the race if we are being paid attention to, if voters are actually aware that we exist. So shows like your own are an excellent way of us getting, um, you know, a little bit of uh, a tool that can be used on social media and uh, at the very least help us get the word out. So I appreciate it immensely. You know, I, I appreciate your time here. And um, one of our pitches that we say is um, if you had 10 issues that you really cared about and five of them had consensus and the other five didn't, which five issues would you focus on first? And I, from what I'm seeing here, you, you have consensus, it seems like, from the left, the right, the middle. So, I mean, so best wishes. It looks like you have a pretty solid campaign. 
So a lot of the questions I was going to ask you, actually, um, you've covered. And uh, so um, I would just, and it's everything from small and mid-sized businesses to accountability, transparency, um, you, you know, military uh, spending and foreign policy, uh, civil liberties, um, trade. Uh, let's just as a final question here. Let me ask you what what is your um, thoughts on uh, our trade policies, uh, trading with other countries, and, and and you can put that as a mix with foreign policy. How do we get along sure. with other countries? Well, uh, very simply put, um, free trade, which is a, such a terrible misnomer, um, because really all it was designed to do was enrich the multinational uh, global ruling class, or as, as Bernie might call them, the oligarchs. <laughs> uh, I've long said that we have an oligarchical system, and it's, it's crazy to call it anything other since I was a kid um, and found out what the word meant. But the trade deals are, are really, they have all been set up very specifically to deal with allowing foreign governments an amount of sovereignty over over our own legal system that is unconstitutional at best. Uh, at worst, what it's allowed our upper middle class and ruling class to do is buy stock in companies that use the equivalent of slave labor in third world countries. And that's immoral and it should be illegal. Um, but we've gone through that period now and we're starting to see some elevation in the Chinas and Vietnams and Mexicos of our world. But that elevation is peanuts compared to the living standard we had built in this country. Um, so we have to be a little bit more isolationist. I really think we should recall ourselves from these trade deals uh, and then renegotiate them entirely from the ground up. And I think a lot of people around the world would agree that that's the right answer, especially workers. Uh, when it comes to military policy and foreign policy, um, there are lots of very convoluted and complicated questions to answer about what's going on in the Middle East. I just like to remind people we're not just at war in the Middle East. Um, when George Bush was in office, there were armed American soldiers in 63 other countries. And under Obama, that's 138. You know, so what we're, what we're seeing in the mainstream news um, is never an accurate reflection of what's actually going on on the ground. We have 900-plus military bases around the world. All of the other countries in the world combined have 30. We have to grow up and say the words, we are the empire. We have to learn it. We have to start talking about it in school. And we have to ask ourselves if we really want to continue being the empire. It's our single largest expense. It's violent. It's brutal. It's immoral. It creates terrorism. Um, we certainly could be a much better humanitarian partner to all of these countries we trade with, and we probably should – uh, you know, take a good hard look at not spending that money any longer. I think we still need a military. I think we still need a warrior class. I I love a lot of the guys that I know who are vets and uh, um, who are signed up and who want to protect our country and the people who live around them and their families, and I'm all for that. But that defense begins right here in the United States, and we don't need to have them all stationed somewhere else around the world where they're really not welcome. Yeah, we can be an a empire or a democratically elected republic. And so Matt Finiciello for Congress.org, District 21, New York, uh, this two, year 2016, November 8th. If you're in District 21, definitely, you know, you want to inform yourself of your choices and your options so you can make the best choice. And uh, even if you're not necessarily in District 21, you might find some interest because you'll be affecting policy for the entire U.S. potentially. And Matt, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, inform our audience here of, uh, you know, someone who's running in a district where they're the only third party candidate besides, you know, the Republican and the Democrat and uh, letting people know uh, possibilities that are out there that they might not have known before. And so uh, good to talk to you. And we thank you so much for your time again, sir. Thanks for the interview. Tom, I thank you so very much. I will uh, talk to you again soon, I hope. Absolutely. Absolutely. Take care, Matt. Thanks. Have a good day.